<laughs> as long as I can remember, he's always been here. Yes. Not just talk about the big dog, yes. but in, uh, more importantly to let us know how our bar must equal our bite. He already has been sounding this song, the alarm, as the blower of the sofa across this country. To let us know as African Americans, our very destiny, our lives depend on that vote. And as Dr. Martin Luther King so eloquently said, the shortest route to freedom and to dignity is the voting booth. He has been working with NAM, with all the nominational bodies, in order that we might get away from this dismal, shiftless state of affairs, yeah. in which we have in this country now, yeah. six to seven million black folks yeah. who are eligible to vote, That's right. who have been so constantly lazy, so cynical, yes. and haven't gotten up to make sure that they take that short step to freedom. So Brother Nelson, come on tonight. You need to just tell us one thing. How we must get up, get out there, and vote so that in this midterm election, we will save the day for this democratic republic called the United States of America. I give to you our chauffeur for the night who will sound the alarm and tell us what we must do to work together, to pray together, to sing together, and vote together until the day will come that this will indeed be one nation under God with liberty and justice for all. I give you our chauffeur, the Reverend Dr. Nelson Rivers, our friend, servant of the people, prophet, scholar, everything that we need, man of the Lord, I thank the Lord himself. I have lived long enough now to be introduced by Reverend Dr. Amos Brown. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Somebody needs to holler like that. The season that we're in, I am, with my usual protocol, I'm going to lift up Alice as I shall and the, the state conference. But before I pray, let me give you just Evidence and testimony of how good God is. The um, you know last year on my Facebook page this morning, they do something called a year ago, and a year ago this very day, I was at a restaurant in L.A. with my mother and my cousin Nancy, who'd come with me to bring mom before we met with her um, her sister, my aunt Helen, and my cousin Janice, and you could not have told us that day, that anyway in the world I'd be standing there now and be able to say, Mama was gone. And so Amos Brown uh, set the stage a few years ago. Uh, Franklin Graham is not even a remnant of his father. And, and his father wasn't much, but Franklin less than that. So the, um, we met with Franklin in 2013 at the call of Amos Brown, because Franklin the Mason crazy negative comments about President Obama. That's right. yeah. And a lot of people claim credit for that meeting, but it was Amos. And Amos called me and asked, uh, would I come because he'd called Franklin and told him he was out of order and he needed to meet. And the summary of the meeting was that Franklin Graham had not had the custom of meeting with black preachers who were really black preachers. He was, he was used to meeting with Toms and boys. And, and, Bootleggers and, and butt kisses, but he was not used to meeting with, with black preachers. And as it would have it, I sat uh, next to uh, Frank, and then across from him was Freddie and Amos 
and others jumped in the meeting because uh, they live in North Carolina, but they thought that they were upstate to them because he came from California and I came from South Carolina. If y'all live here, why did y'all have to wait for us to come? Y'all should have already met with him. Right. But we checked him at the door. Right. And I told him, and Amos told him, and others told him just how out of step he was, but Amos revealed something I didn't know about his dad, about Billy Graham. I didn't think much of Billy Graham, but Amos helped reshape Billy Graham's legacy for me. When he told him in 1954, I believe it was, that Billy Graham came to Jackson, where Amos is from, and Billy Graham had a history of all those years he refused to preach at segregated crusades. And when he got to Jackson, of course, Jackson is the, the belt or the buckle of racism. Yeah. And so Jackson, they had a, li a line, a rope, yeah. between the two groups, the black folk and the white folk. And Billy Graham came out of the stands, went down, and took the rope down and went back and said there is no division in the body of Christ. And so that, that helped me understand that, and then Dr. King had uh, made some comments about Billy Graham that I didn't know about. So Amos called me after we met. This is 2013 now. He said, uh, Franklin told me Billy's about to die. And he didn't want to have just colored folk that he know at his funeral. He needs some real black people at his funeral. So he asked me, would I, would I agree to go to Billy Graham's funeral? And I said, well, Amos, I tell you what, I ain't sure I want to go to Billy Graham's funeral, except to make sure he's dead. But I said, I tell you what, because you asked me, because you asked me, if he does, I will. And don't you know Billy Graham fooled all his children? He lived five more years. He lived so long that I forgot that I said yes. And I got an email from the Billy Graham Foundation asking me would I do them the honor, along with my wife, of coming to the home going or the funeral of Billy Graham. So I said, this must be a hoax. Who would send Nelson Rivers an invitation to go to Billy Graham's room? So I called Amos and asked him, was that what he promised five years ago? He said, yes. So I went. And I went to the funeral, and the only black preachers I heard with it was myself, Dr. Brown, and um, my brother from uh, Warner, Raphael Warner. And there were some other black preachers there, but they weren't black. They were just preachers of color. And so they, uh, in, that, in that moment, I was, I, I finally confessed that I grew a measure of respect for the life of Billy Graham. Because the distance between Billy Graham and the contemporary white evangelicals is so great as a chasm. And in the, in the session, his daughter got up. Yes, sir. Yeah. Now, he had two preaching daughters. Yeah. Franklin can't preach at all. <laughs> Franklin can't even talk, they don't preach. Yeah, yeah. But, and Franklin is a sellout. He is, a, he is nothing more than a front and a shill for Fox News and the right wing mm -hmm. of America. Right. But the daughters, one preached, right. then the other one testified. Right. And the young girl told the story that she was the, the one in the family that they were ashamed of. She married somebody who wasn't in the church. And she finally got divorced, and that was a sin if a young white and Billy Graham's child. And she said that then she hooked up with another man who was worse than the first one, but she didn't know that. If you know he's trifling, you wouldn't hook up with him, but y'all don't know until it's too late. So he said that, she said that she got so embarrassed, because she had to get out of that relationship too. The family talking about her, nobody was, she was embarrassed to go home. So she came up to the house finally with some courage and went up to him. And she said she was trying to rehearse, what am I going to say to my dad? And she said, it's one thing to disappoint your father. It's another thing to disappoint Billy Graham. And she said she got out the car, walked up before she could say a word. He stretched out his hand, hugged her said, welcome home. And I said to myself, that is what's missing 
-hmm. among the white church. That's right. That's right. Yeah. They don't know right. how false it is to talk about a Jesus that you really don't know. Right. Because if you knew Jesus, yeah. you could not be as racist and bigoted and oppressive right. as you are. Right. It is the ignorance of what I call the Christian Pharisee. Yeah. So I'm sitting there with my wife, my wife, it's different. She kind of likes some of these televangelists. I can't stand them. So she had to tell me who they were. Joel came by. I don't care. Charles Stanley come by. I don't like him. And as they kept coming, I said, how do you know all these people? And then Trump, I don't watch them. White preachers on TV. I don't like white, white preachers nowhere, but especially on TV, because I know it ain't real. That's why they're on TV. So, white couple behind us. Trump comes, right? Yeah. And Brother Holland, you know, the Raiders are on my wait list because I'm against the NFL because of the way they treat Cap and the brothers. So I'm on strike. Everybody in my church know. I wear Cap. The only NFL stuff I wear is a t-shirt about cat, about taking a risk is worth it all. And so I'm telling you that I'm a big man, big fan of the Golden State Warriors. So I'm, I wanted to come last night, but if I had I known they were playing last night, I'd come a day early, but I didn't know until too late. So whatever you can do, hook up a brother with a ticket to the Golden State Warriors, I'll be back over here, you hook me up here. So, but, so Trump comes, and when Trump walks in through the front, which is really the back, I'm sitting there, my wife and I refuse to get up. I don't stand for Hitler, I ain't gonna stand for his son. So, so we would move with a white woman. And somebody need to have my white brothers and sisters a class on some kind of black people. It's called, don't get in my space. This woman leaned over to tell me the president is coming. So I ignored her. I don't think you ought to curse a female out. So I ignored her. But she wouldn't let it go. Then she turns to my wife and says, the president is coming. My wife said, we don't care. I wouldn't have had that experience if it wasn't for Amos Brown. So I bless God for him. I've only had a male roommate once in 30 years. I was invited to a conference in D.C. After I got there, they told me we all room together. I said, I don't room with nobody but my wife. I ain't. And I, I definitely have to room with a man. I stopped there 30 some years ago and I, I couldn't afford to get my own room. I don't go. And don't you know, I got to the room and they said, you, you're lucky, your roommate didn't make it. So I'm in the room, and somebody's out there jiggling with the door key. I said, what a devil. I said, somebody done got lost in here. I go look through the hole, the people, who's out there shuffling with his keys, but Amos Brown. I said, Amos, you got the right room. They tell me this is the right room. I said, your bed over there and my bed over here, never between shall meet. <laughs> so Amos Brown, the first man I spent the night in a room with in 30 plus years. Because <laughs> we got it like that. <laughs> Let me thank Alice. You all have lauded Alice as well you should. Alice doesn't always confess that she knows the Lord. But she's had enough stuff to happen in her life that despite what her mouth said she knows how good the Lord is she knew the condition under which I left the NACP I was shocked every time I come to the convention them Negroes act like they don't know what happened get, a, get anonymous what happened me? where you been? Where you? you ended the job I had so I act like y'all don't know what happened and the Negroes were in it's the one who acted like they don't know what happened. All right. <laughs> so I only came to the convention every year. I came to the convention every year, telling the truth, every year, because I went to my 
first convention in 1982. And it so amazed me. I met a man named Mr. Adams. He used to wear an NAACP suit. Oh. All oh. decked out from Miami, Florida. Nice dressing, Mr. Adams. And I asked Mr. Adams, how many conventions have you been coming to? He says, this is my 40th in a row. So I said, my goal is to break Mr. Adams' record. Just because the colors act up on me, I'm not going to act up on right. the NAACP. So I, I come every year. Yeah, that's right. But they don't invite me to do anything. To they'll do what I might say. Right. <laughs> so I woke up one day after Derek became president and was told that Alice Huffman is the chair of the Committee on Membership and Units. Used to be known as the Infamous Committee on Branches. And Alice Huffman is now the chair of the committee I staffed for years. And he helped write all the rules. Leon Russell and I, along with the attorney, Andrew Chicolo, we wrote the condensed constitutions. I was the only staff person on the committee along with the board and Andrew Chicolo. Now, I didn't put all the stuff in the GMG, put some of that mischief in there, let's be clear. So, when Alice became chair, I thought that was significant. But I didn't know that the law was up to something. Then I got a call that from Andre Brown G, one of my many mentees at the NACP, and I have many of them. And she said, I think they're going to ask you to come speak for the membership lunch. And I said, Derek, no. She said, I think so. Because I told him. I said, does Leon know? I said, does Hazel know? He said, Alice is the chairperson. <laughs> Next thing I know, I had a dog on the left. That's right. So you are invited to speak for the membership lunch. And I can tell you two things that the Lord changed me a long time ago. Because if I was still Nelson Rivers Jr.'s son, and not the pastor preacher who been changed by Christ, I'd have used every one of them minutes to go off and just talk about folk like a dog. But something happened, Amos. Yes. Joe, Joe Madison mm -hmm. did such a great job as our political director. That when Joe resigned, the NAACP created the Joe Madison Rule. Y'all know where it came from, but this is the rule. No staff person can run for the board until they've been off staff for two years. That's the Joe Madison Rule. They wrote that in 1980, before the association, the year the association moved to Baltimore to keep Joe from running. I'm telling you what I know. I ain't telling what I heard. So I told Joe this. I said, Joe, I cursed them out for making that rule back then because I know it was for mal and ill intent. But now I thank God. Because if I could have run for the board the first year, I'd have run, got elected, and come raise hell with everybody on the board. Then the second year, I wanted to run, but didn't have time. So the third year when I was eligible to run, I didn't want to run. Because right. the Lord had blessed me so much that if I were to come and act like a fool, I would not be appreciated. God knows more than I ever could know. And what God had in store for me was so much more than what I had. How dare I act like a fool That's like right. the same ones I criticized. And so Alice Huffman, right. God bless you. Bless and God bless keep you. you. I had a rumor that Alice was stepping down as president of the California State Conference. So I had a whole nother message written. I was going to spend the whole time praising Alice, lifting Alice up, having a whole thing. It's going to be better than your funeral because you could be here. It's going to be better than your funeral because you will be here. Then I asked her, my God, and she said, she said, it ain't true. Mm -hmm. I said, let me go back and get my other speech then. Let me take that one back up in the <laughs> Beloved, I said at the, at the luncheon, go with me now in prayer. This is a prayer that I 
learned from one of my teenagers at my church. She's now a freshman at Wilberforce University. Her name is Danae Simmons, and she spoke during the team reflection. And Danae said, Oh Lord, you know. Amen. Danae is an example of the brilliance of our young people. The Lord moved in my heart to create something at Charity Missionary Baptist Church called Diamond Mines. A diamond doesn't look like a diamond in the rock, but it has to have pressure put on before it shines. But you don't, a diamond is not an expense, a diamond is an investment. So I said to the church that I want to send our young people to college. All right, that's right. And any one of them who goes, the church ought to do more than give them fifty dollars and have a look. So every one of them got a thousand dollars. And their pastor took them to visit the campus. And the pastor came back and saw them through. Three of them are now completing the first semester at Wilberforce. All right, and Danae is one of them. All right. One of my members was so inspired, Alice, that he anonymously matched the gift that did something last Sunday called the Charity Gems. And they are students who are in school two or three years. And they need help. Everybody in college needs help, especially if you're black. And he gave anonymously $5,000, $1,000 each. And last Sunday, we announced who those five young people were and realized we missed one. And so we went into the church's treasury to make number six. So this year alone, 11 of our young people have received from their church $1,000 to go to college. And we will do more and more. Why is that? I am a witness and a testimony All right. of what happens when folk invest in the unlikely. The one that might not make it. The one with the big ears and the knock knees. The skinny one. From a family that had no portfolio. Yeah. Mama wasn't a teacher. That's right. Daddy was not a lawyer. Mm. But my daddy told me something when I was a boy that I never forgot. He mm. said, boy, you're rivers. <laughs> and ain't nobody better than a rivers. Right. I don't care who they are, where they are, ain't nothing better than a rivers. <laughs> you don't do it because they do it, you do it because you're a rivers. Yeah. And he told my granddaddy, who I'm named after as well, told me, I bet I'd ever hear you call a white man captain or boss. He said, you ain't got no boss, and you ain't in no ship, you ain't got no captain. And I didn't realize, Dr. Brown, that I was a maladjusted black man until I was grown. I didn't understand how men could shuffle when ain't no music playing. Scratch when ain't nothing itchy. Laugh when ain't nothing funny. And I didn't realize our problem was I came from a tradition of men who would stand up against oppression and racism and bigotry and speak truth to power. I had no choice but to do it. So so is the NACP. So I come by to tell you, we are in a time that try the souls of women and men. We are standing at the precipice of stark and dramatic change in the United States of America. Yes, we are. Yes, sir. We're either going forward yes. in an unexpected, accelerated route, mm. or we're going back to a place that many of us promised we'd never return That's to. Right. That's right. So the National Association mm -hmm. yeah. for the Advancement of Colored People, uh -huh. I share with you what I lifted up at the luncheon because of what has happened every time I've done it. I got so many calls, Sister Alice. 
to come speak for them banquets. And I told all of them except two. I don't do that anymore. Y'all will not get me running all over the country. <laughs> Hollering for them two and three dollars. And then y'all go back and pay somebody else five thousand dollars. Right. Who don't know the story or know the people. I don't have to, and I don't. So I'm going to Evergreen, Alabama, because Dr. King's church, the only church ever pastor, is in Montgomery. And two weeks ago, the pastor of Dexter Avenue invited me to preach the same weekend I'm going to be at Evergreen. And because Jerome Gray, somebody who blessed me years ago, is the secretary of the branch and asked me to come. And I did it for the state conference two weeks ago in South Carolina. I will go, but I don't have to because what I found out is that the Freedom Fund has become your fund for nothing but freedom. But all you do is having a party once a year, and then the rest of your folk catch hell. Because the NAACP spent more time planning for the fun party than planning for the fight. So what the issue now becomes, my job is to tell you who you are, yeah. to whom you belong, yeah. Yeah. and for what purpose you were born. That's right. The NACP was born in the crucible yeah. of the second reconstruction. Yes. The NAACP was birthed when the life of black folk meant nothing yeah. in America. That's right. I have a hard time getting my young folk to understand when somebody lies to them and tell them we had a better segregation. That's the only people say that kind of lie is they never lived through segregation. That's right. That's right. You don't want to go back to segregation because the hallmark of segregation was thingness. Yeah. Dr. King called it thingification yeah. because black folk were thing. Right. How can you lynch folk on Saturday, yeah. burn their bodies, sell their teeth, and go to the church on Sunday and call yourself a Christian unless you believe it was a thing that you killed? Black folk yeah. were just things that America used, That's right. killed at its pleasure and will. That's right. And it was the NAACP that changed the definition of who we are That's right. That's right. from a thing. To the thing that became president of America back in 2008. How could that happen? And it not been for the work of the NACP. That's right, that's right. So you asked the preacher to come, so there must be some preaching in here. Yeah. Mordecai uh -huh. said to Esther, okay. Esther had a good government job. She was a pretty young thing. Yes, she got a job by default. Yeah, yeah. Queen Vashti refused to be disrespected by her. Yeah. And Queen Vashti stood up for womanhood. Yeah. And then the man said, if you don't do what I want to, I'm going to get me a new young thing. Yeah. And he looked all over the hair, the kingdom, for a pretty young woman. And one named Hadassah. He changed her name to Esther. And he invited her to the house. And Esther had a good job. Esther had mink coats and Maserati. Yeah. <laughs> had a meat box. Yeah. Esther had servants. Yeah. Hand and foot. Yeah. Esther had a palatial bedroom. Yes, she only saw the king once a year, which was good, and she didn't want to see him that one time. Yeah. <laughs> but Mordecai, her adopted uncle. Mordecai, traditional black community where we raise children in the family like their own. Some children don't know that's not mama. Yeah. And that's not that. Because right. his mama never told him, I'm not your mom. Yeah. As far as you know, I am your mom. So Esther was raised by Mordecai, and Esther got the job in the king's house, the good government job, and then the king had a man named Heman who was a crook. And uh, like the king we got now, got some people who are crooks. And the king, the king ordered by letter the extinction and the killing of all the Jews. And Esther was told by Mordecai, he has ordered the killing of your family. And Esther said, I can't do anything about it. Because I got a good job. And I can't risk my job. And Mordecai said, Esther, if you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance or relief for the Jews will arise from some other place. Oh, right. But you and your other relatives will die. Right. Who knows? Perhaps you were made queen yeah. for just 
such a time as this. NAACP, I come back to tell you, we were made for this. This is our season. This is our opportunity. This is time for us to do what we've been trained to do, prepared to do. We've been given this chance to do what nobody else can do in America. You're the only people that I can talk to you in California and Carolina on the same day and you have the same message, the same mandate that the mayor can hear from you all over the country. We are the only ones that if you don't do it, who will do it? We were made for this moment. How come you worried and scared of an orange-haired fool who calls himself? I am from South Carolina. I'm from the place of the real bigots and the real racists and the real clan and the real terrorists. I'm from Storm Diamond's home. I ain't worrying about those fake racists. I ain't worrying because I got over on the real one. If the real one didn't stop me, if the real one lost the fight, how could the fake one win? How could the fake one be better than the real one? The only reason you can make it is because you let him do it. There's nobody. This ain't nobody. He's faking to be master. He's faking to be courageous. He's scary. He's a chump and a bully. And where I'm from, we smack bullies in the face and dare them to get back up. Show me what you got. Why would the NAACP be afraid of nobody dressed up in a suit looking like a clown and you should let Bozo scare you? chairman of the board. Yeah. And we went into that meeting. And he leaned over and told that man, I don't want nothing from you. Uh -huh. I didn't come asking for anything. You will not continue to treat my people the way you do it. Because all I got is my life. And I will give it for my people. Then we met with the governor of South Carolina. Only four black folk in the room. You brothers, young sisters, young brothers, let me tell you how it works. You always will know what kind of Negro you with, depending on how they act when they're company. They bad with you, talk trash, holler, all that. Get locked up in jail and put a suit on and walk around with a haircut, cut them dreads off. The fact of the matter is Gibson went and told the governor, he said, Governor Campbell, my people don't play golf with you. My people don't belong to the private club that you belong to. My people don't go to your church. The fact is, Governor, my people have no way to contact you. He said, so my job is to speak for my people. All right. And he said, that's what I do. Okay. He said, there's nothing you can give me because there's nothing you can take from me. Because I am a man when I came in, and I'll be a man when I walk out. But the challenge was this. When they realize NAACP, that they can't shut you up, by threatening your leadership, they can't shut you up. By renting you for a while, if they can't shut you up, then you become the most respected force in your community. That is what distinguishes you from the other fig leaders you got in your community. Because if you holler and shut up when the power comes, then there's something going wrong with them. And I tell you this sincerely, Du Bois 
wrote and worked. Mary White Ovington sacrificed. Yes. Walter White mm -hmm. went undercover as a black man who looked white That's right. to show what the real whites were doing to the real black folk. Mm -hmm. Harry T. Moore mm -hmm. and his wife Harriet were killed mm -hmm. on Christmas night in Mims, Florida, 1951. A bomb put under the bed. Mm -hmm. Harry died there and Harriet lived just a few days. Terrorist struck. All of that because they were advocating one thing that black folk be able to vote. What is so powerful about voting that they will kill you and stop you from doing it? What is so precious about voting that the whole government would array itself to prevent you from exercising? What is it about voting that makes it so that even now in Georgia, they're stealing 53,000 votes? Why is that? Because there's one mistake they made. In the Constitution, they said something they didn't mean. But we've sued them over it ever since. That all America are created equal. And that they have the right to protest and petition their government, right. and that every citizen has the right to vote. Yeah. You understand why they messed up? Because now, the same bigoted, orange-haired clown who goes around the world embarrassing us from sea, the shining sea, the joke of the whole world. I went to Zimbabwe back in January for the first time. I went to Africa so excited and granted before I went, he called the African countries, F whole countries. And don't you know I got to explain them everywhere I go. And don't you know the little sister in Zimbabwe down in Johannesburg told me, Reverend, don't apologize. We feel sorry for you because he ain't our president. He's your president. NAACP, you were made for this. This election is our time to do what they said wouldn't happen. Barack Obama won in 2008 with the biggest black turnout in the history of America. Then he got reelected in 2012 with the biggest, even a bigger turnout. But in 2010, we went off. In 2014, we went off. In 2016, we said it didn't make any difference. But let me help you. You, I'm a big fan of the Golden State Warrior. Been a fan since Steph was in school. And knew his dad, dad. So when they won the first time, I didn't realize they had changed the paradigm. They came up with a theme called strength in numbers. And my research tells me that strength in numbers doesn't mean you got to have a lot of people playing. But everybody who play got to be good. So the, the strength in numbers is from the last one on the bench to the first one off the bench. They got to be good. And when it's their time, they have to perform. Strength in numbers in NACP mean you can't afford trifling branches. So your job is to make sure that if you're on the team, you got to carry your weight. If you're on the team, you got to play. And you can't afford sorry people in your branches. If all you do is argue about the color of the tablecloth, how much the ticket going to cost, who the speaker's going to be, you got to twist it and you need to get real. The fact of the matter is, you need to make sure you got strength in numbers. What does strength in numbers mean? Whether it's step coming off the bench first or the last brother on the bench or the white guy is taller than the rest, when it's time, they got to play. I watched them win that game the other day. Look like they were going to lose sure enough. And don't you know the ball was hanging around the rim and the boy who just came from the team that they defeated, he tipped that thing in. Why? Because strength in numbers. I might not get a chance every week. I might not get a chance all the time. But when it's my chance, you should depend on me when it's my chance I should step up because we got strength in number. I asked when I was at the convention that we would form a partnership with the National National Network 
NACP and all of the civil rights organizations to turn this vote out. We had work now. But black folk, my white brothers and sisters, we on test. What are we going to do? Back in James Brown, they was called a box or boogaloo. <laughs> so, NACP, our grades will be given out on November 7th. All, right. all this talking, all this singing, all this dancing, the grades will be given out on November 7th. Sister Alice, if I had given my original message, it was going to be, dear woman, I see you. The women who confronted Jeff Flake on the elevator, they so affected me that I did a sermon about the Samaritan woman. Jesus, the radical Jesus, Jesus, the revolutionary. Unlike the Pharisees, unlike the Sadducees, unlike the Levites and the priests, Jesus respected women. Jesus was so radical in his approach that Jesus would recognize a woman and see, look her in the eye and say, Dear woman, I see you. And I was going to say about Alice, I was going to say about all women everywhere, this election is about you. And I said, Dear woman, I see you. He might be a bigot, but he's not the biggest person around. Dear woman, I see you. The same men who disrespect you, abuse you, sexually assault you, and got the nerve to ask you for your vote, dear woman, I see you. Jesus went down the list, and everywhere Jesus went, when he would confront a woman, he would say, dear woman, I see you. When the woman was having 18 years of her back bent, and she never got well, and Jesus came, and Jesus bent down to where she was. You see, men have to learn how to meet you where you are. They have to get down to your bent. You bent over. And she was bent over Jesus says, dear woman, I see you. And so there was a woman who had an issue of blood. She had not been able to go to temple, had not been able to go to church for 12 years. Because in those days, a woman had on a menstrual, a woman had a blood disorder, they could not go to church. Think about that. You can't, the very time you need the church the most is when you're going through. And the crazy people in church don't want to let you in the church because you're going through. But Jesus said, come on in, baby, dear woman. I see you. And so there was another woman who went to the well, and Jesus was trying to explain to her how you can get to the well. And Jesus was trying to explain to her that I believe in you. And so the disciples came, looked at him, and said, Why are you talking to that woman? And Jesus said, Shut up, because I got a message. And this woman is the only one I ever going to tell to her face, I am the Messiah. He said, Dear woman, I see you. You need to understand, my sister, that when the time has come for you to lead, it's now. You don't have to ask for permission. You don't have to dance. You don't have to shake your shimmy. You ain't got to give that's enough to get it. You don't have to get buck naked so you can be respected. Dear woman, I see you. And tell the same one, the same one who lied on you and the same one who abused you and the same one sexually assaulted you. So the day of reckoning is coming called November 6th. Dear woman, I see you. And I want you to do what the men can't do. There's a man in Alabama who ran for the Senate. He's a longtime Klansman, a bigot and a racist, and he thought he could still be a bigot in 2017. But I got news for you. Time out for that kind of mess. Dear woman, I see you. You don't have to ask these brothers for help. You don't have to ask them to respect you. Make them respect you by saying, Dear woman, I see you. You don't have to worry. I tell us all the time. I saw somebody say, Women, girls, don't you know this? The daughters of a lion is a still a lion. And the daughters of a dog is still a dog. So the question is, are you the big dog we've been looking for? Dear woman, I see you. You don't have to kiss any butt. Dear woman, I see you. Wouldn't you be great? to be able to stand up on November the 7th and tell every low life, no good, no account man, you fire, you out of here now. Dear woman, I see you. And then you ask what to happen to Rivers came by California and left their dogs out. And the woman 